Listen, 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 listen. Finally, something to look forward to in the fall. I'm not big on autumn, but Atlanta returning, I'm here for it. Hey loves, it's A back on your screen with another one. Hope you're all well. As you can tell from the title today, we're discussing Atlanta season four, episode one, The Most Atlanta. Such a fitting title. For those of you who did not get what needed to be gave from season three, they looped back and gave you nostalgia tease with this one. Personally, me, I love season three. Those anthologies really added to the context and conversation on the culture. But I know a lot of you guys hated it. You said in the last reviews that we did, but I hope that this is an indication that season four, the fourth and final season of this series that has been weird and wild and just shared a wacky side of Atlanta, wraps up in a way that we can all feel satisfied. I really wish that they gave us four more seasons of this, but let's get into it. The episode opens up with this opening scene of Pandemonium in Tarjay. Of course, my favorite character comes in, Darius, Cool as a cucumber, count on him to be calm, cool, and collected in chaos. He has an air fryer in tow, and he goes up to the cash register. The customer service agent is hiding, huddled underneath the desk. Can I get a refund? I don't have a receipt. <laughs> the energy that the cashier gave was the same energy that we all had watching this. Are you serious? But of course, Darius, what have I said? He's always been constant, consistently him. No matter what's going on, he's always going to be who he is. And that's why we love him. I don't know, though, because moments like these have me looking at him like, growth is a thing, Darius. But <laughs> Remember when we did our season three reviews, I said everyone had a story arc except for Darius. He's the only one that has remained the same. I don't know if that's a good thing, but what I do know is the cash register opens. The cashier starting to count the money. And I was like, wait, he said he didn't have a receipt. How are you giving him cash back? but I guess you can't exchange in this situation. The guy looks up, Darius says no, and he darts off. That's how it be when the world is ending. I was confused if this was an ode to the panorama when people were looting or some alternate universe where everything is just pandemonium. But whichever way it goes, <laughs> Darius picks up his air fryer, which if I didn't mention it, one of the funniest lines was when he said, I got this as a gift, but I realize I have an oven. If that isn't a moment, I don't know what is. A lot of times when I go to friends' houses and they have soda streams and air fryers, I said, this is how they catch the millennials slipping. This is what adulting is, having all these little appliances that we really don't need. Everyone who has an air fryer swears by it. I can't have one because of space, but if you have an air fryer and you love it, let me know what your favorite meal is. Darius Defeated picks up his product, heads to the exit, where a woman in a wheelchair is not letting anyone go. She points out Darius of all people and he's like, no, I, I just don't have my receipt, which is so laughable in this circumstance. But we know Darius is an honest man. Then we see him swerve to the side, sidestep, and everyone follows suit. Did you peep the guy with the toilet paper? That would be me. Boring and basic. If the world is ending, you definitely need TP. I'm not stealing a TV or makeup. I'm going to steal a necessity. This scene had me thinking, this is too strange to not be real because Atlanta does that so well. If you know about Lake Lanier, I did my little Googles and what did I find? There was actually a woman in real life who posted up in Minneapolis, Minnesota, Minnesota, Minneapolis. Which way does it go? I never know. Wherever it is, she posted herself up in a wheelchair, got fogged up with a fire extinguisher, all because she didn't want looters to take from Target. She didn't even work there. And even when you work in retail, they say, don't block thieves. That's what security guards are for. They have insurance for that. Smoke settles. Who's the only person left behind looking? Darius. And then this lady just zeroes in on him for the entire episode. If you've watched my reviews before, you know how this goes. Because some episodes get really crazy with the jump cuts and different scenes to storylines, I just talk about one plot line at a time. So finish off Darius and we'll talk about... Al, and then we'll finish off with Ern and Vanessa. For the rest of this episode, Darius is being haunted and taunted by this woman in a wheelchair. At one point, he has a bicycle. Where'd he get that from? And he's towing around this big, dutty air fryer. He looks behind him in an alleyway, and you can hear the train or some kind of bus going, but there's this very low frequency of a whizzing, wheezing wheelchair. It was like a bee buzzing, that annoying sound. 
it really added to the cinematography, which by the way, between the scene shots and songs, everything was on point in this episode. You have to listen to the lyrics of the songs and the song choice to really get the undercurrent of what's going on. Darius pulls a nanny and a boo boo by stepping on a platform saying, I can't get you. By the way, in the real life story, the woman has a knife, like she's ready to jiggy up people, but I didn't see a knife in her hand. I mean, I'm legally blind, so I don't see much, but if I missed it, let me know down below. She's like, I'll wait. I said, she got time today. Why is this woman insistent on waiting? Like Darius said, don't believe what you see on Fox News. I'm not Antifa. <laughs> then it struck me that this scene really embodies the idea that people will pick a criminal or deem someone guilty before innocent. It's kind of a reverse play on what's supposed to be American legality. Here's one person who actually wasn't looting and should be given the benefit of the doubt because we know him as a character, but this lady could care less. She just wants to pick someone to pester because he was the only one left standing. It really speaks to this Karen culture that we've been seeing more prominent as of late, or maybe is just being magnified because of the social media sphere. <laughs> Darius cuts through a broken part of the fence, wanders off, and we see him at the end scene, which we'll get to once we wrap up with Ern and Al. So next up is Al's plot line, because I didn't mention it, but at one point, Darius walks up to Al's car, which is locked in traffic, which is a very popular Atlantic trope. Whenever I hear people from Atlanta all they do is complain about the traffic when he gets in the car he asks where's Al going anyway he says the airport he asks him where because apparently Al isn't satisfied anywhere which really tethers and taps into his storyline and his journey arc they name LA New York places he doesn't like then he says Jamaica Darius throws shade saying they ain't got good kush <laughs> Atlanta always has those not so subtle undercuts. Then you see the woman wheeling up in the rear view mirror. Dare says, can we just exit? I was like, no, we're gonna be stuck in more traffic. So he decides to go get out of the car just in time for the woman to catch up to him. Meanwhile, there's a guy outside of the car saying, I'm friends with Paperboy. He's in this truck, but it's tinted, but you can't see. <laughs> They keep doing that. They keep throwing in little scenes of showing how Paperboy is getting more notoriety. And as we talk about Al's plot line, I love the duality that Brian's character has because it's not just Al and Paperboy, it's the complexity of dealing with the trauma and the loss of a parent. I hope there's gonna be more conversation about that as the season progresses. We definitely get a tinge of that as Darius and Al are talking about this late rapper Blue Bud that's passed. You can see that it's really hitting Al hard. I think on two levels because he lost his mom, because this music probably influenced and inspired him on his own journey. And it really is a reflection on what legacy is, which we've talked about in past episodes before. What really got me was when they were bopping to a track and he said this dropped six months ago. And this track sends him on this wild goose chase, AKA scavenger hunt that for whatever reason had me howling. I can't really put my finger on it, but when he got to the swimming pool area and the music dropped, and if you listen to the lyrics, it tells you what the next step of the journey is gonna be. I just was laughing, I don't know why. It was the excessiveness of it all. I'm over here thinking, ow, weren't you on your way to the airport? I mean, this is interesting, more so than jet setting to Jamaica, so I'm not mad at it. He goes into this food spot, then the guy plays a track on the CD player. Talk about a throwback. This reminds me of episode eight from season three when they were playing music on the iPod. A lot of times they throw in little things like that to kind of show you the juxtaposition of then versus now. And especially when we talk about the music industry and what Paperboy is hoping to get in expectations as we talk about in later scenes, it is very telling and just a very artful way of explaining the transition of the music industry and of Paperboy as a character. But did you guys peep that when he was talking to the guy that was making the Z food or whatever it was called, he wasn't answering him? What kind of customer service is that? The man is asking you a question, you're ignoring him, you pass him the food, he gives you a tip. And that's it, he opens it up, he sees a little stamp, and then he begins this journey of going to the pool, getting these tokens for an arcade, getting a t-shirt. It goes on and on and on, and it's like, where does this end? He ends up in a wake. And there's a woman there, her name is Keisha, and she is Gary's widow. He's like, Gary? And that's how I am every time I find out a rapper's real name. They always have names that you don't expect. And the timing is, so eerie when it comes to Atlanta, because as you guys may already know, PNB Rock passed away 
due to being gunned down last week or was it even this week it was this week actually a lot of rappers died in 2022 which is so crazy and then when you hear in the news their real name you're like really that was your name okay noted not only did this scene remind me of that this scavenger hunt reminded me of mf doom let me know if you felt the same about that it also reminded me of lauren london now if you listen to the angie martinez podcast with her you know exactly where I'm going with this. As the widow is speaking about legacy and expectations and how we don't always get back what we give, it really hit on a different level. As we know that there was already a certain level of contemplation on the Europe leg of the trip for Paperboy. Not only that, when you actually listen to Lauren London's interview or anytime she talks, she's a very spiritual person. I feel like she's not even from this planet. And there was an undercurrent of the same kind of feeling when it came to Gary and his widow talking about him and fulfilling his last desires to the point where she cremated him a month ago, but wouldn't let Paperboy know as he walked up to the coffin to see a skeleton. Oh, that's not his skeleton. That's not his skeleton. Why is it there? What? Ah, the slapstick humor never misses. They always do something messed up with that. Remember episode one, season three? When they drop down that curtain on the guy for the youth nation. It's not, oh my gosh, this show is crazy. This scene was very surreal. I think it speaks to everyone, not just Al Paperboy as an artist and what legacy he leaves and how much you expect to leave an impression on people, but just life in general. When you live, you hope to leave an impact and influence on the people that are here and that's how you truly live on. For him to be the fifth person it's like, who's really consuming the music and who's really taking in what it says? <laughs> As a plant lady, I loved when she said, take one on your way out and point to the nursery of plants. Track 11 will tell you how to take care of it. It just shows you how thought out this person was, knowing that they were going to depart the planet, but what they wanted to impart on their way out. Okay, so let's wrap up with the weird parallel universe that Earn and Van found themselves in. So opening scene for them is they're in a parking lot and Van is thanking him for blocking off time in his schedule. I love this booked and busy version of Earn so much better than season one Dusty. He's like, of course I would for you. And I'm trying to peep, are they back together, rekindling the relationship or they're co-parenting responsibly? Like, what is this? The only thing I know for sure is Van says she wants to get a new phone. On their way, they bump into Kenya who's like, hey, it's been a long time. Why do people do that? Has that ever happened to you? Has an ex ever come up to you? Luckily for me, one of the very few blessings of losing vision is I don't see people I don't wanna see. I mean, I don't see much, but I also will never see an ex that I don't wanna see. So I ain't gotta play like, I didn't see you, it's fine. But in this case, not only does Kenya come up, but a couple other chicks, and when they enter into, I don't know, T-Mobile or whatever exists in the States, Van's making jokes about the phones being large. And this reminds me back in the day when the iPhones got bigger and bigger and people complained. And now everyone lives for a big, big, big screen to the point where I thought getting a bigger screen would mean bigger font. I sound like a boomer. I'm a millennial, I promise. Earn makes a comment about iPads in our pockets pretty much at this point. I think there's even a flip Samsung phone that becomes a full, I don't know. What I do know is Amir comes up giving the same energy that a couple women gave Earn, including the one that was outside the window. And he's like, I didn't even know she'd recognize me from out there. It's super weird. It's like Twilight Zone. Didn't you start to feel a little eerie when this happened? Like, why? Wait, I, I know Van said you bump into everyone at Atlantic Station, but this is crazy. There is nowhere in the six where you bump into that many people. Where you live, does that happen? Is there a spot where you're just bound to bump into people from your past? Because... Let's leave that where it is. As they're walking through, Van's like, oh, I dated this guy, and then I dated this one for three months. Ern says, oh, this one was just under a year, and she took my t-shirt when she left. She's like, oh, I dated this guy from 2012 to 2014. He's the last white man I kissed. I said all of these details, but I'm living for the transparency. If more relationships were like this, things would be more successful, wouldn't you think? I don't the communication is key and it's clearly there between these two van gets the creeps the same way i did after laughing and it's like can we go they start to go to the parking lot they loop back twice where they bump into kenny again so nice to see you Ern says i just saw you that's when they realize something really ain't right they ask kenya 
what's the movie playing in the theater when she first got here? She said, now you see me too, which dropped the same year that this series first started in 2016. So now we're in a time lapse loop type of situation and it really plays into a theory and a theme that we'll explain in a second. Why is it that Kenya starts to freak out and they calm her down? No, 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 it's okay. They walk off to an emergency exit when Van's like, you're going to go and leave me here. Ern's like, you'll never be like any of my exes, which I thought was an allusion to her being child's mother, which is always a level above a regular ex. Was I reading into that? Was I wrong? They both go into this emergency exit, which is a carpeted room that's soaking wet. What does that even mean? They're pushing through to the point where Ern tells Van to kick him, and she's like... All the back and forth in this dark scene was so stupid to me, but I was laughing because I'm like, what is going on? They bust through (laughs) to the wake where Keisha and... Where Al and Keisha are talking about Blue Blood. That's when Al asks, oh, you messed with Blue Blood too? Then Keisha comes through and he says, hey, Keisha. She's like, I followed you. That was giving me heavy TikTok X tease. If you know the trends that are going on TikTok with exes or your current boyfriend's next ex, there's some weird, if you know, you know. I'll leave the funeral van, sees Darius in the distance, says, hey. Is that Darius? He comes up still with the air fryer looking behind his back. They all get in the car. (laughs) Al offers to take Ern to get his car. He's like, nah, you can leave that there. I don't want to go back to that Bermuda Triangle of a place. We'll leave that where it lay. They offer Kenya a ride. She's like, no, my Uber's going to arrive in two minutes. Two minutes can't come too soon because all you hear is that whizzing sound of the wheelchair as the camera pans into her back. And that's a wrap. So many good moments of this episode. The two funniest moments to me was when Paperboy looked into the coffin to see the hat on the skeleton. And when Paperboy said, you F with blue blood too? I don't know what kind of parallel universe time lapse loop that was, but hey, we're in the wild and weird world of Atlanta now. Okay, my theories by character. Let's go with Van first. Hopefully she finds herself more. She seems to be composed which is better than the way we left her off in episode 10 of season three Ern is on his business game and i already watched episode two spoiler alert but he's working on himself and i'm glad to see it al al has a lot of journeying to journey on i cannot wait to see how they develop that character and i really think this moment of blue blood passing and what the wife imparted is going to have a lasting effect on him and his journey especially as we don't know if he got his inspiration back where he's at with fame and living this life back in atlanta now darius is going to remain the same at this point i just expect darius to be darius in every scene if he changes up i love it if he doesn't i love it and as far as themes go The undercurrent of this entire episode was the past coming back. Not only that, it felt like being trapped. Not only are you trapped in traffic, are you trapped in Target? Are you trapped in Atlantic Station with all your exes? It's the past and leaving it where it lay and not allowing it to consume you in the present. That's what it really spoke to. This was a chance for all of the characters to kind of look at themselves, Darius included. And he was the most obvious example of just being completely oblivious. Van and Ern discussing and communicating so clear about their past experiences, let's call it, was refreshing. You don't see that. I don't even know if that's possible in real life, but in this fictitious world, it was, and it was so hilarious. Paperboy meeting with Gary's wife and just having that heart-to-heart about legacy and expectations and what's real and effort. There's going to be a lot of that for sure. And I think that really is something we can reflect on in our lives as we look back at season one and where we were in 2016 to now in 2022. And if we ever watch this episode rerun in the future too. As I mentioned before, I love Atlanta because you can watch it on so many levels. If you just want to watch it as a comedy, go for it. If you want to do a little Googles and learn something new, go for it. If you want to get esoteric with it, spiritual with it, go for it. There's just something for everyone, depending on how much you want to open your mind to interpret the illusions and 
metaphors there are in it. So I'm super excited. This is a bittersweet start. I wish we had four more seasons of this, but for those of you who did not like season three, if this is the type of energy they're giving for season four, I'm sure you will not be disappointed. If you guys like this review, let me know by hitting the like button. Comment down below what your favorite scenes were, who your favorite character was, and what predictions you have. Until next time, stay safe, stay sane, stay blessed. Love and later. Oh, you know what I just thought of? When Van and Ern were traveling through Atlantic Station and bumping into all their exes, that could be symbolism for them going abroad, having this wild experience and coming back home. A lot of people who live outside of the city they've grown up in for six months or years come back and they feel like nothing has changed. And then bumping into people and realizing, oh, you're still working here, you're still doing this, or I haven't seen you since this concert, really tethers you into your own growth and your journey. I've always heard that when you travel abroad and you live abroad, the experience you have can never be equated or compared to if you just stayed stagnant in the same place. I can't really speak to that because I've always lived in Toronto, but when I've had family or friends go away for two years to 10 years, they come back and they act so evolved. I can't say they are evolved, only they can say that, but... I thought that was very interesting since this is the first time we're seeing our four characters since Europe. I don't know, maybe I'm reaching, you know I do that a lot.